welcome back to another super coach video with me jd you were joining me post the pre-arranged intra-club type games that are in the preseason but aren't official games uh yeah this is a sick intro i definitely shouldn't re-record this but hey no edits we never do we just keep rolling on so what we're going through today is i'm, I'm gonna try and uh convey some of the insights I've got from those games as well as some of the caveats if you follow me on Twitter at Jackson Davey I covered I think seven of the nine games on there something like that with my thoughts um, I might have go even go over how I, I review or watch those games just so you've got some ideas for the upcoming ones that are the officially scheduled ones on on how to keep an eye on those um, and then we're going to go through my team's changes um, since that period of time so I went and, you know, unticked a few plays and I've only changed five, which is, you know, I think pretty low, hopefully not too reactionary. Maybe some of the picks will feel reactionary once we put them in um, and, you know, a few rookies and stuff on the bench as well. But the good news is I think a lot of the more unique picks that popped, such as Buderick, Martin, uh, Fife, Yo, depending on, you know, which circles you run in. I already had them all on my team, so I feel like I'm not overreacting to these preseason games. It's kind of confirming that the players that I thought might be good are good, which is always a great thing. And then we'll go through the changes that I made and why some of them have nothing to do with the games, injuries and all that type of stuff. But yeah, we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, all right. So firstly, when watching games, two caveats here. Firstly, a lot of unofficial stats were shared over the weekend and there's nothing wrong with having a look at those to kind of get like a ballpark feel. But the reality is those people are doing it with pen and paper. Champion data when doing it by themselves make a lot of mistakes. And that's with like two callers, someone and back up the ability to review and look at these things at quarter time. So to have you know, even a group of people on Twitter doing this accurately is unrealistic. And you actually saw that where there were discrepancies across different stat tallies and all that type of stuff. So one thing to remember. Secondly, not all these preseason games are born equal. And so just to look at the stats and compare them across games is often not a, a worthwhile activity. You've got players missing from games. You've got some of them that are going for like four quarters. Some of them are going for seven. You've got things like the North game where they were doing 25 minute quarters rather than 20. And then part of that was match them stuff. So you had, you know, North pretending they were up seven and trying to hold on. So they're doing kick to kick in the back line for the last five minutes, which isn't reflective of usually what happens in the second quarter of a game. So there's stuff like this just to be wary of, because when you see she's all 42 disposals and it's because they've had five minute extra length quarters and they're doing like weird training drills as part of it. Like that's not reflective of a real game. So just be wary of the stats. Uh, secondly, I tend to only watch these games to half time, And the reason why is that's when a lot of the better players are pulled or just stopped caring. So it makes it hard for games like the Bulldogs game where they split their best team into two halves. Uh, Cause it meant I didn't watch any Bond or English or anything like that uh, because stuff the dogs, but um, you know, th that's what they're trying to get out of the preseason game, which is fine. They're trialing things and they're trialing different combinations, which is great. It's just not very useful for me to watch because it's not actually much I can learn from the super coach's perspective because it's hard to know what will carry on into the real season or not. So I ended up just watching the half, which had the players that I cared more about looking at, such as Caulfield and, you know, the other teams first half. So anyway, I tend to just watch one half because that's where they play more seriously and they play the better sides. And then Second half, when they're trialing these other guys, I tend not to pay as much attention or take it as seriously. So something to think about this weekend when you go into it. I find the other thing as well is like, it's usually good just to have a handful of plays that you're watching and to look at them closely, because then you can also look at how they're running off the ball, what positions they're getting to, whether they're playing defensively, offensively. I find if you just try and look at whoever's picking up the ball um, and you, you start ball watching, you can go a whole quarter and seal off the football and just realize in hindsight that you didn't absorb much of who performed well and who didn't all that type of stuff. Uh, all right, so let's go through some team changes and we'll talk about some other options that I saw or, you know, thinking about uh, in the preseason as we go through them. So firstly, in defense, um, now that D1 in my last video, I'm pretty sure was Dacos, but he's currently sitting in my midfield. So who did I make room for in defense? And as much as I said, don't pay any attention to the stats, I put in Harry Sheasel. With the reason being that if he was to play halfback, definitely a pick that I was keen on, especially with the the North reasonable buy and what Chisel was able to produce last year. 
but was worried that he was going to be pushed more up into the midfield, especially with Fisher returning to the side. But in that first half, we saw Fisher, Sheasel, and McKercher all playing in that side with the ball still going through Sheasel, all of them getting a lot of it. And that gives me good confidence. Now, obviously, that game is not reflective of real season. I don't expect North to be beating uh, Collingwood, and I don't expect them to be doing those kick-to-kick drills that we saw as part of the game as well. But what I did care about was when Sheasel was in that side with Fisher and McKercher, which role would he be playing? And he played in defense. Now, it's still not perfect because you have players like McDonald missing and some of their other defenders. So when they return, is there a chance that Sheasel gets pushed more up the ground? And I think that is still a yes, but I'm happy enough with what I saw that I think he is still value at his price point. Some of the other players just worth touching on quickly. Stewart, if you liked him, I don't see any reason why you jump off him after the weekend's game. Despite the fact Guthrie went down, he got no CBA time whatsoever. And Cats look like they're going to take a step backwards this year. So the ball should live down in their defensive 50. I think there's a reasonable chance that he's underpriced, especially once you factor in that he had an injury discount as part of this score. So don't mind Tom Stewart as all, at all. And if I was to force in another defender in the side, say I, Yo got injured or something like that, or um, I, I fall out of love with Young, which I think some people might be doing after the weekend's game. He was the fourth midfielder behind Fife, Sarong and, and Brayshaw and played him on the defensive side. So maybe the upside's a little bit more capped than what we'd hoped with Young. He's, you know, he's been a lock all preseason. That's definitely wavering a bit. Um, so yes, yeah, Stewart, I think is definitely a strong alternative. And if you don't like Dacos like I do, then you can jump on him. Sicily, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think he's going to back it up. I've kind of had him pegged for regression for most of it. Uh, the preseason that is. And with the injuries in the back line, uh, I, I just don't think it helps. I mean, yeah, Phillips sounds like he can come in and play a role and should do so well, but he's also an interceptor. And, you know, does that mean Sicily's going to have to play more accountable at times, especially if a forward gets away from Phillips or Frost or something like that. So uh, between that and Amon, um, you know, potentially playing the halfback role, which seemed to take points away from Sicily, I'm still off him. Luke Ryan's apparently injured and can't kick more than 40 meters. So, Already didn't like him, and look, he's only 3% owned, but I don't see any reason why you jump on him. Uh, Sinclair's got a calf issue. Should be back for round one, but yeah, I mean, that rules him out for me. He's at the age where if he's having calf problems, uh, especially in the preseason, interrupted preseason, I'd go anywhere else. Uh, the Port game I didn't watch, so Houston is one that I don't have a read on. I think the only game I didn't watch from the weekend was Port. Crows, so they are the priority watch for me this week. I know a lot of people are still keen on on Dan as a left field option. <coughs> um, only two or three others I maybe want to touch on here from the expensive point. Actually, probably just two more. So Jaden Short played that halfback role and exclusively that halfback role for for the Tigers. I think if he didn't have a buy, he would be a much more interesting option. But as it is, I'm happy to just wait and see on him. And then Whitfield played that amazing halfback role where a lot of ball was going through him. Once again, if he didn't have a buy, I would be very interested in getting burnt by him again. I think he is great value at his price point. Moving down more into the mid prices now. So I think there's really only three worth talking about. Maybe I should filter on ownership just to make sure I'm not um, missing anyone here. But what's, uh, let's go 450 to, I don't know, 300. Yeah, let's try that. Um, oh, there is there. Okay, there's four. I was missing one. Great. Um, all right. So, uh, Kitty Coleman. Uh, yeah, he had a lot of ball on the weekend and looked good with it. Uh, buy is obviously still a problem, and then uh, he cramped up in the preseason game, which isn't a great sign for someone that's had soft injury, soft tissue injury concerns in the past. I don't mind Coleman as an option if he didn't have a buy, but given that he does have a buy, and especially an early one, I think it's one that I'm happy to pass on. Uh, and if something like a yo doesn't work out, then like correcting down to Coleman after his buy could totally be a plan. Yo, so did not score well. No way around it, did not score well whatsoever. But, but... He played what is their main CBA mid, um, was getting clearances and played the full four quarters without injury. We are He's had a very long period of time now where he's played fit and healthy. So I think I'm going to keep backing in this pick until he is no longer fit and healthy. 
if you don't like it, I think it's okay to avoid him. He's still like quite expensively priced. He just happens to work with my structure. Like someone at this price point just helps me out a lot. So I'm okay with him, but I could see myself getting off him still or like upgrading to a steward if I had the extra money, something like that. Windhager, who looked like he was going to get that mid roll, uh, had his hand broken. So there's still a chance that he plays round one, but I think it's hard to go there now if he's carrying an injury like that. And then Buderick, uh, look, been talked up to play that short roll. And it's part of the reason why I pulled him in the side. Promising signs on the weekend, no doubt. Uh, was getting a little bit of the kick-ins as well. Uh, and yeah, ball was going through him, growing into it very nicely, coming off those you know two ACL uh, interrupted seasons. So I think he's great value in his price. The big question is what happens when Powell comes back and how does all of Powell, Buderick and Sexton, who definitely also had that halfback role, interact with each other? In the past, um, those uh, Richmond Tiger teams have been able to hold multiple rebounding halfback defenders that score well. Like you had, what, Short, Floston, and um, not Baker. Who was the other one? Rioli. Um, so like you, they've been able to have a few of these guys actually scoring into the high 90s type range. So, look, it's possible that Buderick and Sexton still do well, even with Powell being back, but that's obviously the big watch for this weekend still, and that is a pick that I could definitely jump off off the back of that. Williams didn't play, um, but he's uh, meant to play this weekend, so we'll get a, a good view on him. And then Caulfield, uh, this is interesting, right? And this is one of the reasons why I say, like, do your own eye test when you can. The variety of opinions on Caulfield across people that watched that game was massive. Uh, I feel like I was in the more favorable camp. There were some that like basically said, didn't see him, wasn't very good, all that type of stuff. And then only changed their opinion once the stats that I'm suspect on for four quarters came out or what it, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, like uh, with Caulfield, I saw someone that played defense well. He ran to get involved in chains, but wasn't a, a main rebounding choice by any means. He was a bit shaky with his disposal at times, but I thought he looked solid down there. And for someone that's come off injury affected seasons and lacks continuity, I think there is definitely something for the dogs to work with there. The challenge is that maybe some of the other players that he might be competing with, such as Bukakamas also played well, slightly different role to Caulfield. But I think that's the one challenge is that there are some competition for his spot. And he wasn't the only one that played well, but at his price, He's going to well, 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 well outperform it. Um, I think if you looked at Twitter once again, I, I released like some rough rookie rankings, which I've got up and we can always refer to. I think he was my number one defender. I don't think that'll change. Even though his job security is not supreme, I think uh, the scoring potential, mature age, all that type of stuff, I, I really like as an, as an option and still happy to have him on field. Uh, and then on the rookies, uh, Gibkiss, we had last time and I, I don't think that'll change. I mean... Tigers don't look like they're going to be particularly good. Ball should be back there a bit. Gibkiss did a couple of nice things, but probably not enough. But preseason game, it's all good. I think like we we know that he can score well enough to make 150k uh, from what he's done in previous years. And if he's fit and healthy and getting through games all right, then that's good enough for me. And then the last one we're going to add in here is... Oh, that's right. We had the filters on. Oh, actually, is Zach Reed. And I should just mention, actually, there's one other on the watch list is um, the Ambrosio from the Hawks that played kind of like halfback wing type role for them, but they were missing um, Amon. So he's also a watch to see what happens this weekend um, and how they structure up and post some of these injuries. But yeah, an alternative to Williams for sure, or like a Buderick, uh, depending on how that goes. Or if you don't even like Caulfield, you could try and run him at D6. Uh, yeah, so Zach Reed for Essendon, 205 centimetre, key position defender, should be taking the second tall each week behind McKay, McKay uh, and looked very good. For someone that's 205, he moves very well. The highlight package that some of the Dons released uh, of him looks very good too. Played a half and then cooled down, which I think makes sense given his injury history. But yeah, third, fourth year in the system, just needs to get games. His job security, I think he'll play every game as long as he's fit. Uh, and I think he actually can score pretty well, even though he's a you know key key position defender. So keen on Reed. Other options here would be Toby Pink, who while he impressed in the hit out, I didn't think was as good on the weekend. 
Uh, you've got uh, Phillips, who I think played in the twos game for Hawks. And for those that watched it, they told me he played well. I haven't seen him. We'll see where he lines up this weekend and if they actually promote him um, to play in that one side. And then you've got um, Marty Hall, who doesn't look like he'll be best 22 for the Ds. And Dan Curtin, who I think also came on in the second stint for Crows. Once again, I didn't watch that game. But yeah, he played key position defender. So I'd rather, I think, take Gibkiss and Reed, who are mature age, uh, playing the same role over over Curtin, who's um, you know first year in the system. All right, into the midfield. Now, I must say, in general, I'm falling out of love with a lot of the mids. Uh, there's not too many that I'm super, super confident in. And I think that got hurt by Walsh, who was one of the players I did like, obviously having flared up or refreshed issues with his back. It sounds like he's still a chance to play round one, but obviously this is the stress issue that's lingered over the past year or so. And I'm not wandering into that if it's been flaring up in the preseason. So off Walsh. Uh, and that means we need to put in someone else. Actually, does it mean I was off another person? Oh, I must have had Brayshaw in this um, and, and removed him before the Pracky games. And look, the practice games didn't do anything to tell me that I needed to have him back in there. The pick with Brayshaw was always because he was injured at the start of last year. He did have some upside built into his price. But the Fife inside midtime looked very real and he played a little bit more half forward, a little bit more outside as a result. Uh, not ideal. I don't think it kills him as a pick completely but just shakes the confidence a little bit that I'd rather start maybe like a day cost over him uh, even though day cost has got the buy so yeah uh, he was out and then look I think to make the money work I put in steel I'm not sure I love this pick to be honest but he is very cheap he's what price sub 100 uh, and looked good enough on the weekend I, I can't imagine he had too many points but one thing to remember is Preseason games are incredibly uncontested for the most part. They're not reflective of the real deal, which is why someone like Sheasel can rock, rock, rack up 40 touches and why almost like every halfback looks good, including a Buderick type. Like you have to keep this, oh, Nick Martin as well, have to keep this in the back of your mind. And on top of that, Essendon and St Kilda were two of the lowest stoppage teams. Actually, they were the two lowest stoppage teams, I'm pretty sure, last year. So they already played a lot of um, transition kind of football, not as much stoppage based. So... Inside mids, Steel, Merritt, Parrish, these types probably aren't going to look as good as they will in the real deal where they actually get more CBAs, more stoppages, all that type of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I think like the speculative ones here, like Steel looked good for what he was. Um, Martin did have that halfback role, which is why we'd put him in the side or why I'd put him in mine. And I don't see any reason why that will change. In that preseason match against the Saints, we still struggled to transition out of defense. It was really bad. Uh, it was it was quite hard watching. Um, so, look, Martin's there to help solve that. I'm sure they'll continue to work on it. Not great. Uh, maybe the risk is that if we can't solve that in the first few weeks that he gets moved into a different position. But uh, And then, yeah, Crouch, once again, didn't watch that game. But from what I heard, was in there for... It was like he was managed low time on ground because he had the hand injury, um, which he should be fine from if you just hearing about that now. But uh, yeah, he he uh, had the CBAs, looked like Crouch. So um, I think, you know, green light for that pick. The only other ones in this, this kind of price point, which I think make or break sides, uh, you obviously had Guthrie who got injured. So he's been struck off the list. And then uh, Wines who did seem to get CBAs as well. I'm told he didn't get... It didn't look particularly good, but the role was there. So keep an eye on him this weekend. Uh, and then of the like mid-price guys, there's really not much to talk about in this range. So you had Wardlaw who had that CBA mid-roll, but just didn't find much of it. And I think that's not very reflective of what will actually happen in the real thing. Once again, it's not a very contested inside game in the preseason. Uh, and then you had really not much anyone else to talk about um oh you got thompson dow i guess who for the tigers so the, we're starting to get quite mid price now now but yeah 250k had main cbas with a lot of the tigers mids missing i'm not sure if that carries over into the real deal the problem with thompson dow was while he could find it he butchered that ball he made uh tim taranto look like lee matthews the way he was butchering that ball so it's just a, like, I can't imagine them starting Taranto and Dow. They might, but it was just ugly, ugly play out of him. And I don't know if 
you can start him at that price because he wasn't efficient and he wasn't getting involved around the ground. So while the contested stuff was good, I mean, it felt like he was a Dow. I was watching another Dow, that's for sure. You cannot deny that. Only other mid price that may be worth talking about is uh, Sheldrick. And he did not have the role on the weekend for the Swans, but Luke Parker today, uh, they came out and said that he broke his arm on that game on the weekend. So if he's broken his arm and is out of the side, that definitely opens up a slot. And he was the number one CBA mid for the Swans last year, 75%. So we can talk about Adams, uh, we can talk about Jordan, and Sheldrick potentially becomes an option as well in that mid price range. They may choose not to use him, but uh, that's it. And then just quickly on the rookies, so McKercher and Sanders, lock, 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 lock. These are easy picks. They both look great. And yes, Sanders had the split in midfield, but by God, he's their third best mid already. Like he's behind Bont and Libba and that's it. He's better than Harms. He's better than McRae from what I saw. Yeah, uh, I know that's a big call, but he's an exciting prospect. That is for sure. And then, yeah, McKercher, that easy roll off half back, able to play to some of his strengths and hide some of his weaknesses at this point in his career. So... I don't see why they wouldn't persist with that at North, and he looked good doing it. He's actually able to open up the games uh, with his foot skills and decision-making, which was nice to see. Uh, and then, yeah, like bench, I think I had Clay Hall last time, so I moved Wilson up here, and then, you know, he he got injured by Yo in their inter-club, so uh, it sucks, but it is what it is. Uh, only other mid-rookie worth talking about is probably Henry Hus Husfeld, who is a uh, watch for me as he's probably the only rookie that I can see that potentially comes on to field for me now as well, like that I actually have confidence fielding. He played the majority of CBAs for the Hawks and looked good doing so. I think he's gone past Ward already. Uh, I think, you know, he's probably better as an inside mid than like Cam McKenzie and stuff as well. And McKenzie looked good in that game, don't get me wrong. But yeah, there's a chance that he's only behind really like Day, Newcomb and Warple. And I mean, I'd probably rather play him than Warple. I don't know it's yeah, no, no, I don't think that'll happen, but yeah, so there's a chance that he's like their third preference CBA mid, at least until day returns, which is going to be a month away. Um, so yeah, you might get a month of on-field scoring out of Husway where he's a main mid for the Hawks. That's a potential. So he's a he's a he's definitely a big watch this weekend as one more rookie that could potentially get on, on ground. Um, so yeah, with, with me not loving necessarily the mid options, like I don't really have another mid that I like outside of what's on my field at the moment. And even Steel and Dacos, I'm not like sold on. The other four I'm pretty comfortable with, but yeah, those two I'm not even loving. So if a Sheldrick does pop out, if a Husbait becomes a must field option, I could see myself restructuring based around those two. Uh, Rucks haven't changed in Gorn and Grundy. Both looked good. Like, yeah, what you'd expect to see. Uh... Grundy played, I guess, on Briggs, so he actually had a real ruck opponent, which not everyone did. Uh, and then I think Cherry looks good as well, but he was playing, I think, VFL quality rucks, I want to say. No, he, I think he played Darcy Cameron for a bit, but then he was playing Steen, and he really beat up on Steen. He didn't score as well on, on Cameron, I don't think. But Cherry looks like a fine option. And once again, if you're looking for extra money and you want to put Gorn down to Cherry, uh, if you don't like Grundy and you want to get in Cherry, I'm like totally on board with that. I think he's fine. Uh, now, the only other change I think I made with this was uh, I would have had Sweet at R3 originally, and now we are going to Conway. Uh, just because Conway played R1 for the Cats, Sweet is definitely behind Soldo, which I thought was the case, but hey, I, I, I mean, yeah, Port, Port fans got it twisted. That's all I can say. Uh, the only other option that really popped up here was, well, Naismith looked good, and I see people on Twitter being very excited today about Nankervis, you know, having plantar fasciitis and problems with that. That isn't new news. It's just sen sensationalized journalism of like things we already knew. We already knew he was touch and go for round one. And I think all the article says is that he's touch and go for round one with that injury. So uh, yeah, it can linger and yeah, it can be a problem and managing it can be tough, but I, like, I don't think that's changed. So I can't see myself really going Naismith at this point, unless we hear that Nankervis is out for multiple weeks with that. Uh, in which case, you know, we get those price rises. So I'm planning for Conway right now, assuming he holds on to R1, which is probably also a bad assumption. I think there's a very good chance that they still give it back to Stanley. So then the other option that came into play was, hopefully his ownership's already shot up, but has um, Livingston, uh, 102K. I think he's like a ruck forward type. And with Flynn having torn his hamstring tendon, which requires 10 to 12 weeks off, it puts BJ Williams back into the R1 spot and then 
uh, West Coast kind of scrambling to figure out what they'll do with uh, a relief ruck forward option to replace BJ. They've got a few other types like Livingston on the side. So he may not end up getting the role, but if he does, you know, that basement price obviously frees up a lot of cash and doesn't need to do as well to actually make some money and provide some bench cover. So he's an option as well. We've kind of got a few on the go, but yeah, I think Sweet's unlikely. It's probably either Conway, Naismith or Livingston. Um, yeah. I did toy around with like, could you run Cherry at, at R3? And I think it's probably too crazy. It's just a little bit too much money. If he was at 250K, 300K, I probably could consider it, but I, I don't think that's going to be the case. All right, and then the last changes, which have been majority to the forward line. And this is definitely, I think, still the line that's going to shape up a lot of the rest of my team. It's been hard. We don't have any premiums, firstly. We've got Flanders, and that's it. Uh, and there's some people that don't even want to start Flanders. So good luck to you if that's, that's the case. Um, then beyond that, we've got lots of mid prices that st stuck their hand up over the weekend, at least in my mind anyway. Billings played the role I expected to see and could see him score well in. Uh, I think the security that has really only been bolstered by Brayshaw's unfortunate retirement um, and some of the other problems that the Ds have had. So, yep. Uh, Jordan played a wing role for the Swans, which once again, I think he can score well enough in at his price to get into the 400Ks. Is he a keeper? Probably not, but could definitely generate some really nice money. And I think his job security is pretty good. Um, yeah, I'm like pretty com comfortable with him, especially now with the Parker injury as well. Mills out those two. Like, I think he's going to be around for, for long enough to, to make some good money. Uh, you've got... Who else? Oh, Fife. I mean, yeah, played CBA mid, full CBA mid for the half, dominated, just getting clearances left, front and center. On the inside, he was crushing it. So, yeah, love that. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, just so good. Oh, it felt like we we're watching a bit of Prime Fife again. It's actually hard to believe we're watching the guy that's been so injury prone for the last two years because just, if you're a Fife fan, it just gave you that hope, like, oh, can we get one more season out of him? Like, I just desperately want to. I think maybe I'm a little bit too invested in the pick. Um, we had Harms who played CBA role at the Dogs once again, split sides. Whether that translates once the full contingent together, I'm not sure. Because once again, I think Sanders gone past him. And I know Harms can play half forward-ish type roles. I don't know if Sanders can, but he can play midfield and he can play it probably better than Harms can. So even though Harms wasn't bad, I'm still worried about exactly what number he falls into that pecking order. Uh, and then, what was it? oh, Taylor Adams didn't play, so he's a watch and wait. Like, obviously, we've got round zero as well with some of these guys, but yep. And then uh, we've got the Fisher, who is actually moving into the side. We've got Zach Fisher, was in my preseason side to start with just because that role is disgusting. And it, I mean, I've got all three North boys in the half back line, which is pretty sicko of me, but. Here we are. Maybe I just need another hamstring injury for him so he comes back out of the side before round one. But I think I'm going to take the punt on it. Like I I don't rate Fisher as a player and it kind of breaks one of my rules, which is just pick players you actually think are good. And like Fisher doesn't really fit into that category for me. I don't think he's particularly great, but I just don't think it matters when you're playing that North half back role. Like I really don't. I think like she's a go huge. I think Fisher could be a forward keeper based on how thin the forward line is. I'm probably going to risk it if he makes it to round one fit from here and he plays the same role again on the weekend next to McKercher and Sheasel. Uh Yeah, the biggest knock was, even though he was like taking, I think he took kick ins and stuff as well at some points, his disposal is just so much worse than McKercher and Sheasel. And it's actually like confusing at times as to why they're trying to get it into his hands over the others. And I think that's probably the biggest risk with this pick. They take away some of that stuff from him if he doesn't clean up his disposal quickly. Maybe it was just an off game, especially with him coming just coming back from injury. But that was probably the biggest concern. And, oh, yes, we need another North player. So we're going to chuck in Tom Powell. Oh, what is happening? Uh, um, so, yeah, he played CBA mid and was awesome. For those that followed my fantasy journey last year, I actually started him in my fantasy side, I think at F5, and he made a little bit of money, but wasn't a good pick in the end because they played him around at half forward too much. Really, um, like it's always hard to go back with these picks because it's like, you know, um, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, can't get fooled, fooled again. Um, shout out Bush. But yeah, like I think if you get burnt by the same pick twice and it's on me and I... 
But at the same time, like he is a really good mid. He should be in their main mid rotations. It's just hard because they didn't play Phillips in there. Uh, I mean, Phillips played in the seconds. I can't do it to myself. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Pals, pals, maybe. I, I could always move this to like a Jordan or something like that as well, um, who's not in my side, but I like Jordan perfectly fine as well. But this is a lot of mid-price madness in the forward line. People are cringing, no doubt, looking at this. But the reason why I structured up a side with this is because I wanted to play around with a team that got rid of all these forward rookies because I am actually not confident on pretty much any of them. So Reed had the role that we talked about a little bit in the preseason, but it shook my confidence i'm playing around with no read teams just to see what the options are out there i'm not committed to it um and i'm i'm curious to see what simpson says after what we saw on the weekend but in the midfield he got pantsed i think pretty badly by fife and sarong and stuff whoever he kind of went up with and then when they played him in defense he played seemingly more lockdown and they did a horrible job of actually freeing him up to play loose and be able to use his decision making and ball skills like we've seen from a Sheasel and Dacos. Like they they put him into the fence, but seemed to miss the whole thrust of what they were trying to do with Sheasel and Dacos, which is just like let him play football without having to worry about the defensive side as, you know, just get him involved with the game, get in touch. They seem to miss that concept altogether. So um yeah, if he was cheap, if he was 123k, I'd still have him in because he's gonna play every game. Uh well at least every game he's fit. But at 207k, this is like quite expensive to get 150k for these types of players they need to go into the 70s and i'm like not sure reed gets there he might have spike games especially in the right matchups but that was that was a bit of concern and look don't overact to one game so i'm not i'm not saying he's ruled out or anything like that i'm just playing around we're just having a little bit of exploration we've got another full week of practice games and then we've got round zero as well for more information and where he fits into that but i've been shook enough to play around so he's out at the moment um look finn mccray and uh, lazar i think the other two i'm going to talk about so finn mccray played majority cba mid minutes for collingwood looked great in the first quarter and then he just went full pac-man ghost mode and ran away and you didn't really see him um after that point so that's a bit of a concern because it's fading in and out of games i think he's like a sub candidate type to be honest and uh, Pies were missing like Pendlebury. I think they're missing Pendlebury again for the practice game this weekend. Once again, it's going to be hard to judge him on where he sits. Uh, got round zero, which is great. You'll actually get to a feel on him. But yeah, I've not super confident on him. And then Lazaro was the other one who played some um, CBA midtime for North. I think he had moments in that game where he was really good, but it wasn't necessarily playing as a CBA mid. Like it was running through the middle at parts in transition it wasn't necessarily winning at the coal face i think they'd be better served by having like ldu wardlaw power in there and then lazaro pushing up at stoppages and once again at his price he's got to go kind of like 70 ish average to be worthwhile and i'm not sure he gets there i'm like i know he's uh, had a very good preseason and a lot of people rate him highly i think i'm one of the least confident on lazaro at least of what i've spoken to um same with finn and I can't tell at this point if I'm less confident on them because I'm seeing something that others aren't, if I'm being too cautious or if other people just really need those rookies for their structure. And so they're seeing things that aren't there. I actually can't tell what's going on at the moment. So uh, yeah, it's pretty scary because then well, who's left on the rookies? These are the ones we've been talking about. So um, Alex Sexton, chuck him in there. I must say, Gold Coast being straight shooters, we've had three bits of news on fantasy over the preseason. Like, Flanders is good. Get him in. Uh, Sexton's playing half back. He's looked really good. Lock him in. I think Flanders said that about Sexton. And then um, uh, the news article about Buderick playing like that short role. And we saw all three of those things on the weekend. So I have no reason to believe that they won't hold true. So, uh, yeah, Sexton racks it up in that role. Will well outperform his price, mature age, and all that type of stuff as well. If he holds it with power back and continues to get involved uh, with what we saw on the weekend, then yeah, let's go. And then I haven't got much money left to fill out the side. So we're going to go with um, Laurie, who uh, tossing around a little bit, he played like a half forward role, you know, Chandler, Deja Vu, but was was very good. Got a lot of the ball, uh, was involved in, you know, setting up goals. Uh, I liked him as well. I think the problem is Brown, who's 102K, I want to say, also played very well. And they've got a few at that fringe spot, which I think are competing for spots. But 
I think he's a very good chance to be best 22 for them uh, and can make reasonable money, more mature guy as well. And we've seen that role be lucrative for D's place in the past. And then we're going to go Cadman for now. Uh, look, he kicked four or five goals. And that's not really the reason that I'm putting him in there. I mean, it helps. But uh, another year in the system obviously looks bigger. They tried to persist with him as long as they could last year, even though he's getting smashed and beat around. So I think his job security is pretty good, which is more that can be said for a lot of others. Uh, he's got the round zero game. So we get to see, firstly, if a good score gets put into his um, system. And they're against the Pies as well, which, I don't know, defensively, maybe they're somewhat suspect. Oh, if he gets like a Darcy Moore, though, probably not. But anyway, so if he scores well against them, that's good signs. And then he's got very soft draw with North and West Coast. So... Um, I think he can kind of get like that three game stretch. And if after those three games and he gets his first price rise, he hasn't been particularly good. I can kind of correct him at that point. But if he has had a big boost game against uh, North or West Coast, he's kicked a bag in one of those two, which is possible just given that he kicked four in the practice game, uh, then yeah, you get some really nice price rises out of him. So I've got Cadman in there at the moment. I, I think that means, who, did I, who have I dropped? So I dropped Clay Hall from the midfield and moved Wilson up. And then I've dropped... Uh, Manor, Sean Manor, who wasn't in the starting um, team for the Cats. Now, that may change with Guthrie's injury. Maybe he gets moved up into that A side. But, uh, yeah, if while he's a mature age player that can score well, and I'd love to have him on my side, he didn't get put in that one side. So we'll be watching this weekend to see where he goes. But, yeah, this is the side now um, after that. Well, basically since the last update, which was a couple of weeks ago anyway. So some stuff has changed due to injuries um, and some of it's changed due to what's happened on the weekend and what we observed with roles. And once again, that's what we're watching for. Roles, not necessarily scores, but it's about the role. So yo, full-time CBA mid, played four quarters, tick. Fife, full CBA mid, tick. Sheasel, full halfback, tick. Buderick, short roll, tick. So this is like the types of things that we're looking for and what we saw was good signs. So we're moving on with these players. What they actually scored doesn't necessarily matter as much. Um, you know, Fisher, full halfback role, tick. Powerful midfield role, tick. So yeah, th these are the types of things we're looking for. And uh, this team is probably still too mid-pricey. You've got, yeah, I mean, Yo, Buderick. You've got Steele, Martin, Crouch. You've got Grundy, Gorn, Powell, Fisher, Five Filling. So it's a lot of mid-prices. A, a little bit scary. So look, this might tighten up uh, as we see more and we get closer to best 22 teams. But... Thought I'd give you an update on how the team's evolved based on what I've saw as well as then hopefully share some knowledge on what I cared about, what I was looking at as the games went on over the weekend and put you in a good position to keep an eye out for what you should be considering this weekend as you update your sides too. But as always, thank you for joining me. If you have any questions, please feel free to hit me up below and I'll, I try and get back to all of them. I, I try and do my best. I usually do, but uh, yeah, I'll see you in the comments below and then I'll see you in the next one. Peace.